Section 3.3, we're going to be looking at increasing and decreasing functions in the first derivative test. Um, one of the things that we did back in section 3.1 that um, you guys just took the quiz over is we identified places where we had critical points. Do you remember that? Um, and critical points led to potentially uh, relative max or min points, and maybe even they were absolute max and min points, right? Um, well, those critical points actually do another feature for us. They actually help us determine um, whether a graph has increasing or decreasing features. And so that's what we're going to be taking a look at in this section. Um, so first, to talk about this from a very, um, uh, very abstract perspective, like very specific, um, is the terms of increasing and decreasing. So um, you know, we t I work with this in my college algebra class, but I don't give them this kind of a definition. Um, we just talk about it going uphill and downhill. Um, all those things are still true. There's nothing about that that's false. This is just more rigorous. So an interval is increasing when it has the condition that when x1 is less than x2, f of x1 is less than f of x2. So if we're taking a look at an interval, it would look something like this if it were increasing, and it's, it's exactly what you know to be true. So x1 has to come before x2, and we have some graph that's doing something between them. And in order for it to be considered an increasing graph, the y value at x1, so f of x1, has to be less than the y value at x2, f of x2, and it has to work for all the points in between, right? That's what the interval, for the interval to be increasing means that that feature has to be true for the whole, the whole interval. And of course, decreasing works the same way. Um, we still need x1 less than x2, all right? So we're still moving from left to right is what that means on your, on your graph. Um, but now instead we have x1 here, we'll put x2 here. We have the graph going, you know, downhill, so to speak. So over here, the f of x1 value is actually bigger than the f of x2 value. And that is what we would mean by a graph decreasing. Um, notice it doesn't say how it increases or how it decreases. So as I drew this, um, it didn't have to look like that, right? It could have looked like this, or it could have looked like this. We don't have any information about the how. We just know the shape overall has a decreasing tendency. So this leads us to theorem 3.5, which was connecting us back to those critical points I mentioned before. So theorem 3.5 tells us, suppose that f is continuous on the interval, and f prime of x is greater than 0, okay, the derivative. Is there something wrong? Oh, there is a difference on that. It should say differentiable. Continuous isn't false, but it's not enough. I don't know why it's uh, not right in those parts, but thank you for noticing that. Yeah, it should say differentiable. It does on your notes. That's what, yeah. Does your say it on the on your notes, Nick? It is differential. My notes are on the slides just wrong. It's just a typo. Uh, it's not false. It's just not a strong enough condition. Thank you for noticing. I appreciate that. Okay, so suppose we have a differentiable function. Uh, if it's not differentiable, we can't guarantee the next parts are true. So, if f prime of x is greater than zero, right? So the derivative is positive. Is what that's saying. For all of the x values in that interval then the f of x itself, right, the original graph is increasing. So if you take a look back here at what we described as being increasing, I drew something that was kind of straight. Um, so let me change my graph just so that we can act. Well, actually, it's fine. It doesn't really matter. Um, if we were to take any point along this curve, we'll use red, and we were to find the tangent line, right? We've talked about the tangent line. Um, so imagine taking a straight edge and lining it up against that point. The tangent line would look something like this, right? So every time a graph is increasing, the tangent line will have a positive slope, right? Yeah, that's all this first fact says. It says that if I have a positive uh, first derivative, right, the tangent line has a positive slope, then it means that the graph is increasing. And by the similar definition on number two, if the derivative is negative, right, if f prime of x is less than zero, 
then it's decreasing. And over here on the graph, we can do the same thing, right? We can put this particular point or wherever you want to do it. And if we draw our tangent line at that point, the tangent line is a negative sloped tangent line, okay? So when we have a positive derivative, we have an increasing original graph. If we have a negative derivative, we have a decreasing original graph. And if the derivative is zero on an interval, it means that the graph is constant. And what we saw happening in section 3.1 was the derivative being zero at a maximum or minimum, right? Just a specific point. Now we're expanding that idea to being on an interval. It has to be doing this. So if on an entire interval the derivative is zero, the only thing that could be happening is that we have a constant graph to begin with. Does that make sense? All right, so that leads us into what's called the first derivative test. So the first derivative test talks about how we can use this idea of increasing and decreasing and relate it back to maximums and minimums. So suppose that f is continuous on the interval, capital or uh, closed interval AB, and a critical point is happening between AB on the open interval AB. If f prime of x is greater than zero from, x, from A to C, and f prime of x is less than zero from C to B, I'll draw a picture with those pieces in there in a minute, i.e., the description is in parentheses, f changes from increasing to decreasing, then f of C is a local minimum. I'm sorry, maximum. We read it right. Local maximum. Okay, so the part in parentheses description says it's changing from increasing to decreasing, right? That's what the description says. I'll draw the whole thing out in a second. And it's saying if it's changing from increasing to decreasing, we have a maximum value, and we should all say, well, yes, if you're going from increasing and then you're going to decreasing, you've got to cross through a maximum because it's a continuous graph. I can't just jump over the maximum spot, right? I have to cross through it. Now, this description right here is talking about the fact that here, we'll, we'll use our closed interval, AB. I'll actually have space over here. I have a little bit of space over here. Let me draw the picture over here that they're describing. So you have an interval. It's going from A to B, and C is somewhere in between, right? It's telling us over here that the derivative is positive Okay, that means the graph's increasing between A and C. Oops, back over here. So the graph's going uphill somehow between A and C. And then from C to, A to B, it's going downhill. And so it's telling us that it's crossing through a location right here that is a critical point. And that critical point, which we identified as a critical point before, is a maximum value. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether that critical point actually is a nice, smooth derivative equal to zero. It might be. Or it might be a sharp turn. That's okay, too. It's still a maximum value. And if we flip this whole picture upside down, we have part two on this, where it says if we go from a derivative that's negative from A to C, and then it's positive from C to B, then we have a local minimum. So I'll just draw the sketch of that here and not do the other screen. So it's going decreasing initially from A to C, and then it's increasing from C to B. And so this location right here must be a minimum value. Okay. And the last one says if F of C has the same sign, right? So if it's increasing from A to C and then it's increasing from C to B, or if it's decreasing from A to B, A to C, and then it's decreasing from B, uh, C to B, then that actually does not have any local extrema. Um, and a really good example of that, um, we've seen it before, but I'll draw it again, a real quick sketch in here, is the example of x cubed. So on the graph of y equal x cubed, there is a location here in the middle where the derivative is zero. If I drew it well, it would look better. But there is a derivative of zero in the middle. But you can see that the graph is increasing before that, and it's increasing after that. So clearly, that's not a maximum or minimum value based on the derivatives, too. Okay, you knew it wasn't looking at the picture. But it's also true based on derivatives. Derivative is positive. The derivative is positive. The derivative sign didn't change. Therefore, it's not a maximum or minimum value. No extreme. 
So what we're going to be doing on our couple of examples here on the next page is identifying, using that first derivative test, intervals which are increasing and decreasing. So as we're looking for things to be increasing and decreasing, this is very much going to feel like what you just did on your quiz on that very first question where you're finding relative extrema. You're finding the derivative, you're setting it equal to zero. Like that's the first step, okay? And it happened, of course, in your um, Raleigh's theorem questions, too. Um, but we're finding derivatives, we're setting them equal to zero. So the first thing to do is to find this derivative. So what is the derivative of this function? One, one minus four over x. Okay, so if you want to think about rewriting it, we've got x plus 4x to the negative 1. So this would be 1 minus 4x to the negative 2. And some of you are simplifying as you go because you can see it really well, and that's great. And so you have 1 over or 1 minus uh, 4 over x squared. Okay, is everybody good with that? Okay, so we're setting it equal to 0. Okay, we're looking for critical points is what we're actually doing. We're looking for the critical point just like you did back in section 3.1. So as we're setting this equal to 0, this is 1 equals 4 over x squared. Uh, if you want to get common denominators, that's fine. Cross multiplying works just, just as well, so I'm going to do 1 over 1. So if I cross multiply here, I get that x squared is equal to 4, and so what does x equal? Positive or negative 2. Um, it doesn't actually give me an interval specifically, and so when that's the case, we're looking at the entire number line. Okay. Now, there's actually one other critical point. Do you know what it is? The asymptote, which is at what value for x? 0. Yeah. So x equals 0 is also a critical point because this is where the derivative, y prime, is, does not exist. So asymptotes have the ability to change the direction of increasing, decreasing. They don't give us any you know, maximums or minimums. I mean, that's true. They don't. But they do change increasing, decreasing. For example, let me just do a real quick sketch of a graph that you're familiar with. This is the graph of 1 over x, and it looks like this, roughly. I think I may have flipped it upside down. I think it looks like that. Uh, at any rate, whichever one it looks like, I don't really care. You can see that half of the graph is increasing and the other half of the graph is decreasing. Actually, that's not a true one. That's not the one I want. I want this one. Oh, now I got the graph right. How about that? All right, the asymptote is occurring um, at the y-axis. It is increasing on the left and it's decreasing on the right. Okay, so the asymptote can actually change the direction of the increasing and decreasing just like maximums and minimums can. So we want to be careful that we're observing those possibilities as well. So we actually have three different values. So what we're going to do is something um, that you may have seen a similar type of a description done with um, absolute value inequalities back in college algebra. If you don't know what I'm talking about and it's not resonating, just ignore that fact. It doesn't matter. But it is something that is often taught along with absolute value graphs in college algebra or in a, in a similar type course in high school. So what you're going to do is you're going to set up a number line and you're going to put those particular locations on your number line in order, of course. So you have negative 2, you have 0, and you have 2. Those are the three potential locations where my graph changes direction. Everybody good so far? Okay. Then you're going to test a point in each of those intervals to see what happens. All right, so you're going to look at the graph and you're going to pick a value in this case that's coming before negative two. Okay, so any value will be just fine. Negative three. negative three would be fantastic. And so I'm gonna write it in red just as a reminder to ourselves. It's not really on my graph, it's just a test point. And what we wanna know is we wanna know, you can use any of the versions of the derivative that you have. Um, I kinda like the one where we wrote it like this, personally. And we're going to put in negative 3. And what we want to know is when I put negative 3 in, is it positive or is it negative? Those are my only options. Okay, it can't be 0, right, because the only zeros were at negative 2 and, negative, or, and positive 2. So it's not going to be 0. So when I put in negative 3 into this, so I'm going to actually rewrite this with function notation so it's easier for us to see. When I put negative 3 into this, I'll, I'll write out the first couple of them that we do. The question is, do I have a positive value or do I have a negative value? I don't really care what the value is. Which one is it? I think it's positive. Double check. Positive is what I have written down in my notes, which could definitely be wrong. One minus four ninths. So it's positive, right? Okay. So this one's positive. 
So I have a positive value right here. I'm just going to write positive on the, the number line for now. Now we need to pick a value between negative 2 and 0. Negative 1 would be nice. Okay, it's not the only option, but it's probably without doubt the nicest one. So we're going to take that and we're going to do the same thing, f prime of negative 1. So I'm going to put in negative 1. And I want to know, is it positive or is it negative? Uh, that one's negative, isn't it? So I have a negative right here. Okay, I need a value between 0 and 2. 1. Um, this is actually really nice at this point, right? Because uh, the values that are going in right at this point are squaring every time, right? So the sign does not matter. So you should be able to look at this very quickly with the work we've already done and tell me what the sign is when I put in the number 1. It's negative. So this is a negative, and I'll just by symmetry put in 3 bigger than, I mean for the value bigger than 2, and when I put in 3, I get a positive, okay? So this right here tells us exactly the solution that we're looking for, because the question wants to know where it's increasing or decreasing, and so I should be able to read it right off of the number line. The positives are the places where it's increasing, because a positive derivative is an increasing graph. And the negatives are the places where it's decreasing because a negative derivative is a negative or is a decreasing graph. So we'll start with the far left. And so I'm working from negative infinity to, to negative 2. And the, that part is actually increasing, right? And then it stops increasing all the way until I get over here. And then it's increasing again from 2 to infinity. I hope you remember some of this interval notation because it's really nice to use when we're identifying these intervals. The part that it's decreasing, it's very tempting to say that it's decreasing from negative 2 to 2, but it is not because what's happening is 0. There's an asymptote. So I do need to identify that there is a break in the graph there. So the graph is, in fact, decreasing from negative 2 to 0, and it's increasing from 0 to 2. So this is the answer to the question that I'm asking. Do you have a question? No, we're good. Okay. Okay, is everybody good? Most of what I've written down is things you're going to have to show in order to get there, right? Now, that said, I'm pretty sure that just about everybody in here is working with a graphing calculator. Could you verify that this is what your graph is doing by looking at the graph? I would hope that you would. Um, I, I think it would be silly not to use that technology to verify what we're doing. It's not using calculus to use your calculator to verify it, but we should verify what we're doing as we're looking at it and make sure that that makes sense so that if we've made an error, we can catch it and we can go back and fix it. Okay? Let's try another one. Um, we have our have a trig function on this one. So f of x is equal to cosine squared of x minus cosine of x. And we're all very grateful when they give us an interval with cosine curves because they do continue on forever, right, with the same cyclic patterns. We don't want to write all the intervals out like that. That's not going to be a fun task. So we do have an interval on this one um, that we'll be trapped between. Um, on all of these functions that are asking us questions about increasing, decreasing, just like when you were looking at extremas, we're taking derivatives, okay? This whole chapter is about applications of derivatives. So we are taking the derivative of this. Now you saw a derivative like this a little bit, at least on your last test. When you have cosine squared of x, what do you have to do to find its derivative? Chain. You have to do the chain rule, because what's really going on here is that you have a cosine of x quantity squared. That's what's really going on, like if you write it out sort of in a longer form. So we'll bring our 2 down. We'll rewrite the cosine of x to the power 1. If you don't want to write the power 1, it doesn't matter. But then I need to take the derivative of the cosine of x, which is negative sine of x. And we'll clean all of this up in a moment. And then I have minus cosine of x at the end here that I need to take the derivative of. And that would be positive sine of x. Lovely. So as I clean this up a little bit, um, I would probably pull the negative to the front for the negative sign. And I would probably write this as negative 2 cosine x sine x, or you could put the sine x first. It doesn't make any difference. Plus sine x. Okay, so far so good? 
Okay, so now we're operating with trying to find where this is equal to zero, which involves trig. Um, so much like algebra, when I have multiple trig functions, I want to look and see if there's anything that factors out. And there is here. What factors out? Sine of x. So I'll factor the sine x out first. And when I do, I'm left with negative 2 cosine x plus 1. Okay, so far so good. Okay. And then again, just like with polynomials, we set each parentheses piece equal to 0 to solve them separately, right? So we're dealing with the sine of x equals 0. And we're dealing with negative 2 cosine x plus 1 equals 0. The first one's the easier one. Um, so whether you're thinking unit circle or whether you're thinking a graph, it doesn't matter to me. I'm going to gravitate toward unit circle, so that's what I'm going to show on this from here on probably. Um, I wanted to know where sine of x is equal to 0. So on my unit circle, the sine values, right, so we're going from 0 to 2 pi, so the unit circle works nicely. The sine values are the y values, and where do you see y values that are 0? At what angle measures? Five, zero, two, yeah, these angle measures on the corners. So um, all the ones on the right are my even pi's, right? 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, and so forth, and negatives of them. And the ones on my left are my odd pi's, pi, 3 pi, 5 pi, and all the negatives of those as well. We're only going around the rotation one time, and we're actually not including the endpoints, right? It says strictly less than, I believe. So we don't actually want 0 and 2 pi. They'll cap our endpoints of, our, of our, our number line in a moment, but they're not going to actually um, extend beyond them or anything like that. So as we're looking at this, the only x value between 0 and 2 pi for which sine of x is equal to 0 is a pi. It's only one. The next one's harder because it's not 0. <laughs> so I need to solve this now for cosine of x. So we'll subtract our 1 and divide by our negative 2. And the cosine of x needs to equal 1 half. It's a positive 1 half. So let's remind ourselves a little bit about unit circle stuff. Um, on your unit circle, which quadrants, 1, let me, let me label them on here, so if, throw my hands up here. Here's 1, 2, 3, and 4. In which quadrants are the cosine values positive? One and four. So we're looking in these intervals, and they're positive there because cosine are my x values. X values are positive on the right-hand side of the graph. We need my cosine values to be one half. So there's the um, the locations where I get one halves for either sines or cosines are always at pi over sixes and pi's over threes. Okay, that, that's, we just have to figure out which one it is in the right quadrant. But they're always pi's and sixes and pi's over threes. Okay. So the only time we get locations where we get square root two over two, those are the pi over fours. Okay, so I'm just, I know you guys have heard this before, but I'm reminding because it may have been a hot minute since you had trig. Okay, at least it's been over the summer, minimum, right? Yeah. Okay, so it's either going to happen here or it's going to happen here. And if we can determine where it happens in the first quadrant, we can mirror it down to the second quadrant. Cosine is the x value. So which of those two have an x value that's smaller? Because one half is smaller than radical three over two. Is it the one that's closer in, right here, or is it the one that's further out? Closer in is the shorter x value. So what I'm looking at here on this location is that this x value is this far out, right? So that's the one I want. So my value that I'm looking for here is this one right here. And what is the angle measure of that particular location? Pi thirds. Good job. So this one is pi over 3. It's one of them anyway. And I need the mirror image down here, like this. You gotta figure out, in pi, it'll be something over three. Which one is it? Ooh, I'm hearing lots of things. Four or five? Those are the two ones I hear most. It's five. It'll be five pi over three. So if we count around our circle, let me just do that real quick with you. So this one was one pi over three. I'd have two pi over three here. 3 pi over 3 is actually the same as 180 degrees. So 4 pi over 3 occurs down here, and I'm at 5 pi over 3 now. Okay? So it is 5 pi over 3. So I have three critical points that I just found, and I'm capped with my intervals from 0 to 2 pi. So as I create my number line, my number line will start at 0. 
and it will end at two pi. And I don't need to worry about like properly like divvying it up. It's completely irrelevant. I just need the numbers on there in order. So which of these three values will I list first? Pi over three. Pi over three. And then pi. And then five pi over three. And so I actually end up with several intervals to test. I have this one right here. So I've got the interval between zero and pi thirds. The interval between pi thirds and pi between pi and pi, 5 pi over 3, and between 5 pi over 3 and 2 pi. Here's the deal. I don't care what the numbers are that I test, right? They just have to be in the interval. So we're going to test things that are easy to put in a calculator. Let's grab a calculator. I'll grab my, oh, I don't have mine with me. Somebody's just going to have to help me as we work. So pi over 3. What is pi over 3 approximately equal to? A nice, wonderful, easy value. It's 60 degrees, but I mean in terms of a number. One. one. Pi is about 3.14, right? You divide it by three, you're looking at something that's approximately one. Why do I mention it? Because I really just need a number between zero and one. That's easier to think about than a number between zero and pi thirds. <laughs> Don't you agree? It is. So you can pick whatever number you'd like. Um, I'm kind of tempted to just go with one half. I feel like I need a little bit more space to write here, so I'm going to shift these over just a touch. So we're going to, I'm going to try 0 0.5. And we're putting it into the derivative, and you can use any form of it you'd like. I would just use this one because it's easy to put it in. I'd put that into y1 in your calculator. So in y1, I would put in negative 2 cosine x, sine x, plus sine x. Um, I know we've double-checked before, but you might want to double-check again that you've got your calculator in radians just to be sure in case you've loaned it to somebody or it's been used for somebody doing some kind of trig with degrees or something recently. And I just use your table. Go into your table and put in 0 0.5. Because remember, we don't care what the value is, so it can be ugly. We care what the sign is. Is the sign positive or is the sign negative? It's negative. So as I'm looking at this right here, this is a negative value. So what we did over here, I'll write it down, is that we found is calling it f, f prime of 0 0.5, and we did it in our calculator, and it was negative. So pi over 3 is 1. Pi, of course, is 3.14, so it's almost 3, or approximately 3. What's the number between 1 and 3? <laughs> 2 would be great. We can use the number 2. And since you've already got your calculator set up, if you're using the table the way that I was uh, giving as an option, you can just put 2 as the x value in the table. All right, so derivative evaluated at 2, and it is positive. All right, cool. Now, we kind of expect that these are going to oscillate, so that seems reasonable. But don't just decide that it's going to oscillate and don't do the rest of the work, because it doesn't always work out that way, especially when you have things going on, like squaring and things multiplied together. It just doesn't. So do be very careful on that. All right, so pi is about 3. 2 pi is about 6. What is 5 pi over 3? It's about 5. Okay, we'll go with that. So I need a number between 3 and 5? 4. We'll go with 4. So we can use the number 4, f prime of 4. And what do you get? A negative. Cool. Um, and then you can use 5 and a half if you wish. Uh, you could remember that 2 pi is really like 6.28. So if you wanted to use 6, you could, and it would be okay. Um, if you want to be like, no, I'd really want to make sure it's really, really between, 5.5 is fine. Your calculator is doing all the heavy lifting at this point anyway, right? I mean, really. So pick a number between 5 and 6-ish. 5.5 is what I'm going to use. And what's it give you? A positive. Lovely. So this sign chart has all my answer in it now. Positives and negatives. Positives mean... Increasing and negatives mean decreasing. Awesome. And so we should be able to read it just like we did on the last problem where we're reading from left to right the pieces that are increasing versus decreasing. So I need a little bit more space. Let me, let me shift actually all of this a little bit. Okay, let's just go with that. All right, so we are going to read from left to right. It starts out on this one as decreasing, so I'm going to list that one first, not because I care, but just because I like to go from left to right. So it's decreasing on what interval to start with? 
Purple. This one starts at zero. So this one actually closed off my interval endpoints. If it helps you on the graph to remind yourself as you're looking back later, you're welcome to sort of put those parentheses on the endpoints there, kind of like you would have done in an algebra class to remind you that they, they do end our interval. Um, so it does start at zero and it goes to pi over three. And then where does the next decreasing point pick up? Pi and, oops, sorry, I don't know why I make that so funny, pi, and it goes to five pi over three, right? So where is the graph increasing? Pi over three to pi. Pi over three to pi. Union, five pi over three to two pi. And again, could you graph this? Just to make sure that that seems reasonable. Is the graph really going from decreasing to increasing to decreasing to increasing? Yeah. Now you may not look at it and know for sure that at those very specific values, depending on the scale of your graph, but you should be able to give a pretty good idea. Um, adjusting the scale in your calculator would probably help a lot. So if you made the maximum and the minimum the zero and the, and the two pi, right, the interval really looks like that, and you tell it to do something where it has trig values, that might be useful. Um, so those kinds of features would be helpful. But you should get that same interval um, information showing up. Okay, I think we have time for one more because it's actually pretty quick. Um, this direction actually looks like there's more pieces to it. There's really not a lot more pieces to it than what we've already been doing. We would find the critical numbers. We've been doing that already. Find the open intervals where the function is increasing or decreasing. That's creating the number line but not identifying where yet. C is applying the first derivative to find the relative extrema. So that's the new step. That's actually where we're deciding, oh, look, because it went from increasing to decreasing, it's a maximum. Because it went from decreasing to enemy, decreasing to increasing, it's a minimum, okay? So that's a new step, but it's very quick at the end. And the last one is just confirming with the calculator. So this is a familiar graph to you. You know what this looks like anyway. What is this graph? It's quadratic. It's a parabola opening down, which means it's going to have a relative maximum. So those are things from your prior knowledge that you know going into this situation. What's its derivative? Negative 4x plus 4. Setting it equal to 0, what will x equal? 1. Okay? We've done part A. I'll label them as we go. Part B is to create my number line. So my interval is going to be from, zero, uh, from negative infinity to 1 and then from 1 to infinity. And I want to pick a number in each of those intervals. I'll pick 0 and 2, but you can pick whatever you'd like. And you're trying to evaluate by plugging it in, and you still are going to show it, even though you already told me it's a parabola opening down. So I know you know the graph is going to do this. You're still going to show the calculus for it. You're plugging it into this equation. So when I put zero into the equation in the box, do I get a positive or a negative? Positive. And when I put a two into the number in the box, I get a negative. So this actually means that the graph is increasing from negative infinity to one and it's decreasing from one to infinity, correct? Okay, so if you wanna go back and really look at the details of how it's written on the first derivative test, you can. But what you can also do is you can also draw sort of a shortened picture of what's happening here. Again, I know we're gonna be looking at the actual graph in a moment, but I'd like to think generally speaking of, well, what happens if it's not a parabola? Because we just happen to use a parabola here, right? But the features are going to be the same whether it's a parabola or not. Increasing means it's going uphill. So I can just draw a little, you know, slooping thing going uphill, right? The next one, the negative decreasing means it goes downhill. So I can just sort of draw a little hash mark in there going downhill. And you should be able to look now and tell me what's happening when it changes direction. What is that a maximum, right? It's a maximum. So step three, or part C here, is actually telling us that we have a maximum. The maximum is at the x value of 1. How do I find the corresponding y value? You plug it into the original equation. So if I plug the number 1 into this original equation, what are you going to get? 5. 5 is what I got, too. I hope that's right. 5? So maximum is at 1, 5. And the first derivative test, like the verification that we really did the first derivative test, 
is that we drew these little sh shapes. I mean, that's actually us verifying that we did it with the right method. That's the first derivative test. And the last thing is to confirm with a calculator. So I will let you put it into your calculator. Since I don't have mine, I'll just sketch what I've got written on my paper. Um, the graph is a parabola. It is opening down, and it basically has this shape like this. This is at 5. We have this going on. And this graph should match all the details that I just found. So did we do an easy one? Yeah, it's an easy one. But it has all the same features as the more difficult ones. And we'll pick up on a more difficult one with part four, number four, next time. OK? No there is no homework due on Wednesday because we're only partway through this lesson. You're right. Have a great week.